Don't walk through the world looking for evidence that you don't belong because you will always find it. Don't walk through the world looking for evidence that you're not enough because you'll always find it. Our worth and our belonging are not negotiated with other people. We carry those inside of our hearts. And so for me, I know who I am. I'm clear about that. And I'm not going to negotiate that with you. I will negotiate a contract with you. I will negotiate maybe even a topic with you, but I'm not going to negotiate who I am with you because then, and this is, I think the heart of the book, then I may fit in for you, but I no longer belong to myself. And that is a betrayal I am not willing to do anymore. I spent the first 30 years of my life doing that. I'm not willing to betray myself anymore to fit in with you. I just can't do it. I've just never done anything that's turned out to be valuable that wasn't just scared shitless to do it. Like everything I've ever done that's ever really made a contribution, I have felt alone in doing it Mm -hmm. and afraid, but alive. Yeah. Well, I think what what I have found is that after the first time, and it only really takes one time, after the first time that you opt to brave the wilderness, you pull away from what a group of people thinks. Maybe it's your maybe it's your creative community, it's your critics. The first time you pull away and find power in standing on your own, I think your heart is marked by the wild. I think you belong in into the wilderness in a different way. Because every time after that, when you choose fitting in over belonging to yourself, it's painful. And so to me, The whole idea is not just navigating the wilderness, which I think every poet and theologian and writer over time has used the wilderness as this kind of a lone journey thing. It's not just about navigating the wilderness, it's about becoming the wilderness. It's about becoming, I am going to be on my own a lot and it's going to be okay because there is beauty and strength in that. And it's not that I won't ever find great joy in being a part of something, Mm but I will always belong to and believe in myself first. Vulnerability is defined as uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. Can you name one act of courage that you've ever been involved in or that you've ever even witnessed that did not involve uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure? And it's a loaded question because I know the answer is no, Mm -hmm. because I've asked it thousands and thousands. I've, I've stood in front of Navy SEALs and special forces military personnel and said, give me an example. I want you to try hard to give me an example of courage that didn't require vulnerability. And in 10 years, I've never had a single person be able to come up. I've even had two guys come up to me who were in the military that said, we're going to think about it and get with you. Mm -hmm. Give me an example of courage, even on the field that doesn't involve vulnerability. If you think you're being brave and it doesn't involve risk or uncertainty, you're not being that brave. This is the passage that changes my life. It's not the critic who counts. It's not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done it better. The credit belongs to the person who's actually in the arena, whose face is marred with blood and sweat and dust, who at the best, in the end, knows the triumph of high achievement and who at worst, if he fails, he fails daring greatly. It is not about winning. It's not about losing. It's about showing up and being seen. The second thing, this is who I want to be. I want to create. I want to make things that didn't exist before I touched them. I want to show up and be seen in my work and in my life. And if you're going to show up and be seen, there is only one guarantee. And that is you will get your ass kicked. That is the guarantee. That's the only certainty you have. If you're gonna go in the arena and spend any time in there whatsoever, especially if you've committed to creating in your life, you will get your ass kicked. So you have to decide at that moment, I think for all of us, if courage is a value that we hold, this is a consequence. You can't avoid it. This is the question. You know, this is when the universe comes down and puts her hands on your shoulders and pulls you close and whispers in your ear, I'm not fucking around. You're halfway to dead. Hmm. The armor is keeping you from growing into the gifts I've given you. That is not without penalty. Time is up. So this is what you see happen to people in midlife. 
And it's not a crisis. It's a slow, brutal unraveling. And this is where everything that we thought protected us keeps us from being the partners, the parents, the professionals, the people that we want to be. And so you really have a choice in midlife. I'm not saying just pull off all the armor and streak through Austin because I think you can't replace the armor with something. I think it's curiosity is what you replace it. You just become very curious about yourself, about the world. Why did I react that way? Curiosity is really the superpower for the second half of our lives because it keeps us learning, it keeps us asking questions and it increases our self-awareness. If something happens and you're overwhelmed with shame, the first thing you need to do is get back on your emotional feet. Don't talk, text, or type to anyone because the first, one of the things we wanna do is push that shit out on other people. <laughs> Get into a dark, quiet place and then talk to yourself like you talk to someone you love. Just be like, dude, it's okay. Like you screwed this up. You, what you said was super hurtful. You're gonna have to circle back and clean that stuff up, but give yourself a break here. Then reach out and talk to someone about what you're feeling. Shame cannot survive being spoken. So if, you, if I call you and I'm like, oh my God, Lewis, I'm in a shame shit storm. You're not gonna believe what happened. And you listen to me and you respond empathically or empathetically oh my God, I've been there, or oh God, I get it, I'm sorry, that sucks. Shame can't hold on, because shame can't survive empathy. So, when, so two choices, you own your story, you get to write the ending. You don't own the story, the story owns you. The thing that I learned about belonging that I think is so powerful and that I cling to as a creative is that belonging is not something we negotiate with the external world. It's something we carry in our hearts. And as it turns out that the men and women who have the highest levels of true belonging not only find sacred being a part of something bigger, mm -hmm. but they have the courage to stand alone. And the reason why art and creativity are gonna be so important to our healing and to whatever comes next in our world is every creative knows what it's like to stand alone. And so creatives have this incredible ability when they find the confidence to be able to find beauty and value in being part of a creative community, mm -hmm. but also the courage to stand alone. And so what I would say to you is understand, and I wouldn't say this as a therapist, I would just say it as a fellow yeah. creative that's sure. found my own pain and success, is be a part of a creative group and community, but don't ever believe for a second that you are not going to have to stand on your own. If I had a dollar, for every interview I did with a late 20, early 30 year old that got on the engineer, lawyer, doctor path because that was the moving escalator for smart people who was depressed, hated what they did, never even knew that you could be a shoe designer or a casting director or a microphone builder. If I had a dollar for every one of those, like. Set for life. Set for life. I used to think the best way to put your work out into the world is to make sure the critics are not in the arena. But you have no control over who's in the arena. And the best way I have found is to know that they're there and to know exactly what they're going to say to you. The three seats that will always be taken when you walk into the arena, when you share your work with someone, the three seats that will always be taken are shame, scarcity and comparison. Shame, completely universal human emotion. We all have it. It's that gremlin that whispers, you're not, you're not enough. The other seat that's always taken is scarcity. What am I doing that everyone, what am I doing that's original? Everyone else is doing this. 150 people are doing it who are better trained than, I'm tra than I am. The third seat, always comparison. How many of you ever struggle with comparison? The thing is, I don't care what people think. I don't worry about the critics in the arena. It sends a huge red flag up for me. We're hardwired for connection. When we stop caring what people think, we lose our capacity for connection. When we become defined by what people think, we lose our capacity to be vulnerable. So, Rather than locking these folks out from the arena, what I'm gonna invite you to do 
is reserve seats for them. The whole idea of the wilderness being those times when we stand alone and those times when we go out on a limb, the times we walk away from what we know, our ideological bunkers and our beliefs, braving is the tool to help us manage the wilderness. I'll leave you with this. There will be times when standing alone feels too hard, too scary, and we'll doubt our ability to make our way through the uncertainty. Someone somewhere will say, don't do it. You don't have what it takes to survive the wilderness. This is when you reach deep into your wild heart and remind yourself, I am the wilderness.